Okay, welcome back to Engaging Leaders in Knowledge. Uh, following uh, Terry's uh, stimulating discussion, we now have a panel discussion uh, with leaders in the federal sector uh, of our uh, government who will be talking about some of the issues and some of the challenges of talent management within the federal government. And to do a quick introduction of each, uh, to my left is Gervis Grigg, who is the FBI's chief knowledge officer, and he is probably one of the most senior uh, CKOs in the government since uh, he was appointed since December of 2006. In that role of CKO, he's focused on how people, systems, and technologies exchange data, information, and content to meet the Bureau's goals and objectives. Prior to the FBI, he worked as a stock bond and insurance broker in the financial services, and so certainly a very broad uh, connection uh, uh, with Gervis, and uh, we'll look forward to some of the discussions there. We also have Catherine Medina, who's the Executive Director, Chief Human Capital Officers Council in the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. The council is responsible for leading the strategic management of human capital for the federal workforce of 1.9 million employees. Definitely appreciate you being here with 1.9 million employees. Uh, and is also the first provo for HR University, the federal government's central source of human resource training and development. And finally, from NASA, we have Jerry Buckholz, who is the NASA Chief Human Capital Officer and the Assistant Administrator for Human Capital Management. And her responsibilities include setting the agency's workforce development strategy, assessing future workforce needs, and aligning human capital initiatives with the NASA mission, strategies, and performance outcomes. I thank all of you for taking the time to, to be with us and for sharing your, your insights. I'd like to, to start by talking about talent development, talent management, uh, in terms of what are some of the approaches and strategies. And to, to start broadest, I'll start uh, with you, Catherine. How does uh, talent management uh, look across the federal government as a whole? Well, that's a loaded question, but <laughs> uh, some really great things, uh, I think, um, are on the forefront. Uh, when you think about talent management, and I really appreciated uh, the discussion with Terry and all the things that he had to say with the project management perspective, because I think one of the most exciting things we're doing with the Chico Council right now is working on closing critical skill gaps. And I think if you, whether you're talking about project management skills or you're talking about other skills or competencies, um, before you can look at developing your talent, I think you have to have a good assessment of your inventory. You have to understand what kind of talent you have and where there are gaps. And then when you look at those gaps, you can start to determine a strategy for closing them and what kind of uh, training, what kind of development opportunities you can use to do that. Mm, excellent. And obviously it's a very broad span. Uh, Gervis, what uh, from an FBI perspective and uh, you're our uh, CKO, over there. So what are some of your thoughts in terms of talent management and some of those issues? Well, thanks, Ed. You know, what she said is exactly the case. Closing those skill gaps, but how can you close the gap until you know what that is? Um, so for the FBI, uh, our, our task is to then take translate that vision down into action in our individual agencies. And so for the Bureau, you know, it's about recruiting, developing, and retaining that ki that critical talent in those skill areas. And we do that in a number of ways, uh, everything from our academy where new employees go through uh, to learn their initial skills and be oriented onto the program. In fact, a program that we have, uh, one that's called the ONE program, where all employees, regardless of their job title, role, or task, come through, and for the first week they get oriented together. So whether they're coming in as a special agent or an intelligence analyst, a linguist, or a project manager in the IT branch, they go through this onboard, common onboarding experience. And then they have ongoing developmental opportunities throughout their career um, and uh, everything from mentoring to leadership development and ongoing training using virtual academy and learning. But I really would like what she says there about the uh, understanding and assessing those critical gaps because then that then can help you determine your strategy about how to close them. And so obviously the different programs uh, that address the competencies that, that, that Catherine was talking about and onboarding and developing workforce. Uh, Jerry, uh, I how, thought, how does NASA approach it? And, uh, 
We've already gotten nice credit from Yes, from we Terry, got a so. lot of nice credit from Terry. And I would say he said uh, some very interesting things today during his presentation, specifically around the importance of setting the right culture um, as project complexity increases, the need for social skills increases, and the idea that the federal government, which has a high degree of political savvy requirements, also requires a high degree of social skills. And I would say that we are focusing very much in these areas. Uh, we have several uh, development programs, our NASA FIRST program for high potential employees, and our mid-level leader program where we take very talented people, many of whom are mem you know, participants in your Apple programs, and really work on developing those social skills um, in, and giving them the ability to, to lead people, to lead projects, and to infuse the workforce with the NASA, NASA culture that we have decided as an agency um, is the culture that we want to have. So I do think it's a really interesting combination of pursuing the technical capabilities and technical learning along with that interpersonal learning that really makes NASA unique and its approach to developing its talent unique. Yeah. One of the things that uh, it's clear, we know that there's a lot that goes on and uh, there's al always, you know, whether it's workforce or industry who, who want to promote more different things. How do you determine what is a good practice so that it's so good that we're going to invest increasingly limited funds. So what is a, uh, what does a good practice look like uh, in terms of developing uh, the workforce and in terms of talent management? And, uh, well, I thought what uh, the, the point Terry made about e-learning and the pitfalls of e-learning was a good point to make. So a lot of federal agencies are doing some great things with uh, training and development and uh, workforce development. Um, about two years ago, the Chico Council came together to address a government-wide focus on critical HR skills. And to that end, we created um, HR University. And so when you look at um, things that we create that can be leveraged more broadly than an agency, I think that's definitely, in bigger terms, a best practice. So what we've learned from two years into HR University is that stakeholders such as GAO look at the platform we created and said we need to do more of this. Mm -hmm. um, particularly in the issue of um, taking training and development, looking at best practices across agencies and bringing that into one central location. Um, we neither have the luxury of resources or talent uh, to be duplicating efforts as we have in the past. So um, it really couldn't have come at a better time. So if you look at best practices in the broadest sense, I think HR University is a great model. Um, but then again, there are other agency-specific um, um, projects that, that I think are notable. VA uh, has its own learning university. And what I like about VA is that they're focusing on ROI. So they've made a heavy investment on measuring the return on investment for learning and development. And as we know, as learning and development professionals, if you can't measure it and you can't prove its value, uh, you're pretty much doomed uh, as far as the future of those investments. Uh, USDA has its own uh, learning academy and they invest heavily in specialized technical training for the Department of Agriculture. Uh, so those are a few examples that I can think of. Oh, uh, uh, what makes a good practice I think is very individual to the organization and its mission. Um, what is a good practice here at NASA is not necessarily a good practice um, at, for example, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission where I spent several years. So the alignment between what it is you are working on and your overall arch overarching strategy is absolutely critical. So the centerpiece of our human capital strategy at NASA is innovation. And Innovation is essentially the NASA mission, and so we really have thought long and hard about what are the human capital components that foster innovation in a workplace. And one of those was uh, connecting our people to each other and to the mission. And so as we started contemplating that question and contemplating, you know, how do we deliver training, how do we deliver learning to our workforce, um, and acknowledging that we needed to use more virtual environments and use more technology to do that, that that was the smart thing to do. 
we came up with the idea of a virtual executive summit, uh, which ran in October. It was a virtual environment that had pre-taped uh, sessions, similar to what we are doing here today. There were live sessions through Adobe Connect. There were reading materials that people could go and read in on their own time. There was the mandatory training that all agency employees are required to take each year. And there were uh, Saturn courses linked in as related to the executive core qualifications of the federal government. Mm -hmm. And what we found was we entered into this, we called it an experiment, uh, with a lot of skepticism that we had our most senior leadership of the agency who really didn't believe that we could have a meaningful experience in this virtual environment at the beginning and through that process converted them to believing that virtual environments were a great way for people to learn, for people to connect with each other. So I think there's a component there of leaning forward. Um, we've talked about risk in this sec uh, session quite a bit. I would say it's really more leaning forward and seizing opportunities. Um, and really going out there and trying some new things, knowing that you will may fail, um, but even in failure, you will learn a lot that will help you be successful the next go round. So that leaning forward component and that tied back to your core strategy. Component. Yeah, no, it's interesting too because you make one of the things that's becoming a theme is that we're going through major change. We need to do things differently. We need to collaborate, uh, and so we're we're taking risk. We're doing things differently. It's innovation, and there's always a an initial skepticism, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's it's the the uh, the importance of going forward. And being able to determine, you know, how these good practices are supported and given a chance to, to, to be effective. Because I know what you were talking about, the initial, is this isn't going to work. And then, yeah. wow, it worked. So it worked. Do it, more was, of it. it was wonderful, yeah. actually. It was great. Yeah. Uh, Gervis? People have a natural desire to want to connect with others. And when she's talking about the virtual environment and the, this growth in the type of training that we're attempting to deliver, it's about helping people connect with the content, connect with each other, connect with their instructor. Um, with your original question about best practices, right. you know that really in and of itself is making a judgment statement itself. This is a best practice. Well, who says it's a best practice? And so one of the challenges that I, I know we face, and, and I'm sure other organizations as well, is determining well, what really is a best practice. What's the criteria for determining if this is a best practice? You may go to one regional component, and they've implemented a solution. And it works very well in that ecosystem. But, supplant, but taken out of that ecosystem and replanted elsewhere, it withers and dies, and people wonder, why is that? Well, because it's a different ecosystem. Um, and so some things have enterprise capability, and some things are best left franchised at the local level. Uh, you can look throughout business history and you can find a particular person starts a hamburger joint, it's fairly popular, and then it becomes franchise. Next thing you know, it's global. Well, some things do, can scale globally and some things don't. For us, it's, it's looking at those criteria. How is it aligned to our strategy? What's the cultural components of that? And then you go through that decision matrix to decide, is this something that has franchise capability and enterprise implications? And um, each culture is slightly different. And when you can find the marriage between those two, you find practices that really truly rise to being an enterprise best practice. At the same time, you don't want to suppress local innovation. You want to allow that to continue to foster because one of those will grow up and become an enterprise solution as well as meeting the local needs, which is part of your objective. Yeah, we've all, uh, from the, the whole po focus on good practices, I'm hearing things like competencies. Do we know the skills we need and do we know how to develop them? You hear about context which is we need to make sure that it's being worked at the right level. It's different between a field, uh, maybe a center location from, from an agency-wide or a federal-wide, and I hear about connection keeps coming up of how do we connect people uh, in, in terms of what we're doing. Um, one of the challenges, you know, and I guess opportunities as well, is that the, the government is going through a change of generation. Uh, we have a lot of uh, individuals, uh, baby boomers, able to or set to retire and how do we prepare for the opportunities of a new generation young professionals coming on board uh, in terms of trying to maximize the knowledge uh, from one generation to the next keeping the good and uh, you know maybe improving on you know how we've done things uh, any thoughts of uh, of that how do we link talent management to a young generation and to a to to a change in terms of uh, 
our organizations? Um, I think we live in marvelous times. Uh, I, I have been waiting for what we have now my whole life. Um, and we know for thousands of years, human beings transferred knowledge through storytelling. Mm -hmm. And now every single person out there practically has a device that allows them to tell a story every day, whether it's Twitter and we're telling the story of this session on Twitter or Facebook or YouTube. So I think that we have tools available to us that have not been available ever before and we really need to capitalize those and use those. The advantage that we have over past generations of human beings is that these stories are now memorialized for all to share in and for generations in the future to see. Um, and you know I am so excited about the the social media about um, using these uh, social media technologies and virtual environments um, for that very purpose, to have the people who are leaving a legacy have the opportunity to leave that legacy in a way that can be shared for generations to come. Mm. A true continuous learning because mm -hmm. you can keep it, you know, the, the, those ideas as long as you want. You right. know, if you look at the invention of the printing press and the acceleration and in innovation and knowledge sharing that happened across the globe in just a short span of time, we went for thousands of years where the world moved at a somewhat glacial pace. Then we become into the age where we begin to find ways to effectively codify knowledge and share it on a broad scale. We saw an acceleration in learning, an acceleration in innovation. Populations increased. Tools and technologies that have been used for decades, centuries, generations began to accelerate quickly. I, I happen to concur. It's an exciting time to see how we can increase the codification of what human beings know, what their experiences are, and allow them to connect with others in ways not previously possible. Um, and in organizations such as the ones we represent, it's how do we take that human desire to connect with others, to share what it is we know, and bring that to the community so that we can learn from each other. We have the now benefit of being able to look back in the past and see the lessons learned. And it's really, it's the future and that then tells us whether that was a lesson learned. Um, one of the things we've talked about before is if you really want to change the culture of your organization, start asking a single question in your project management reviews. What have we learned? You'll find oftentimes in project management reviews and, and in, in updates and summaries, that question has failed to be asked. So what have we learned thus far? If that question is consistently asked by management, leadership, project managers, then before the meeting, people begin to prepare. Well, I probably better think about that. What have we learned so far? And then they began to collect those. And they said, well, gosh, if we're going to collect them, we probably ought to write them down somewhere. If we're going to write them down somewhere, we probably ought to store them and then share them. And so you begin to build that knowledge base of what have we learned. And then those in the future generation can look at it and say, ah, this is where we came from. Here's how we can go in the future. So it becomes a mindset of being a reflective practitioner is part of our job. It's not just delivering you know, the good project, and I don't have to worry about the organization as a whole, but part of it is how do I share, how do I capture it, how do I make learning a part of what we're doing? Right. We do have a project underway in my office. Um, we're calling it scientific storytelling, where we're really trying to teach NASA scientists and engineers to develop, um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it a program, but um, a way of thinking, a philosophy around uh, telling your story to the world and sharing that story um, and using the different technologies that are available, videotaping your story, posting your story, so that a much broader range of people out there um, in the audience, uh, in the, on the internet, etc., have access to your story and understand what it is that you're working on in layman's terms. So it's something that I'm very excited about, uh, that we have a couple of people working on um, that I think shows great promise, both in terms of uh, telling NASA's story to the world, but also in terms of knowledge management and, you know, really getting in on the ground of some of the really big things that we're working on right now yeah. as an agency. Well, that sounds like a great, great project. And as you do more of that, our people become more effective at these kinds of things. Right. Uh, Catherine? Well... I agree with uh, Jerry's um, sense of optimism, and I, I definitely think there's the need for knowledge management, and then the, the resources that are available available to us. Uh, I'm not really sure we're getting 
the right leverage of those resources at this point. And it concerns me a little bit because as somebody who's fairly new to the federal government, I see um, a lot of resources in front of us, not only the technology, but the federal government as a workforce uh, is one that is invested in long term. So if you look at your workers, you see longevity uh, compared to the private sector. And I'm not really sure we, we take advantage of that investment and over the lifespan of an employee really get that knowledge management and knowledge transfer that we should. Uh, so I like to see more of that, but I don't see it as coming top down. I think to leverage the technology, we need our new generation mm -hmm. to embrace the technology and really to push it bottom up and say, um, I know how to use the tools and I'm demanding in a sense that um, I'm going to capture this knowledge. And I think if they lead the charge, I think it'll take us a lot further than where we've been. Yeah. What's your, you mentioned the concern about currently leveraging resources. What's your greatest concern, that we don't know how to leverage it, or we, we're in our stovepipes so we don't want to leverage it? or, or I, think we, it's a know. I think it's a combination of things. But if I look at, you know, anecdotally, people I've seen retire, particularly when they have a policy expertise, or technical expertise. And it's just an interesting phenomena that I've observed as a somewhat of an outsider where we say, oh, so-and-so is retiring in a year. I mean, people plan out these retirements in the federal government, and you have a long lead time in many cases. And we look forward to celebrating someone's life and career in the federal service, as we should. But that time, I don't think we maximize that transfer of knowledge, and that concerns me. Yeah. So to that regard, we feel the same way. A number of years ago, we began a knowledge capture program where we identify those that are in key positions for turnover or eligible for retirement, and then we get with them because you do have that telecasting that I'm going to be leaving at X date in the future. And so we get with them and go through a structured process to help to capture their best practices, their lessons learned, their observations from their time at the agency. Uh, and uh, that's been really effective. We've done hundreds of those, uh, and, and not just those that are leaving for retirement, but those that are turning over in key positions and then encouraging them to create job books so that they have these turnover folders for the person that comes into the chair behind them so we can minimize that friction and maximize the knowledge transfer uh, between changeover. And I think as we look at the velocity of turnover in the federal workforce, the uh, d changing demographics both in age and in skill, um, these kinds of practices at agencies are going to become ever more important. The last thing I would say about that is, though, we've got to make, if we implement programs like that, it's got to be done in a way that is part of your natural daily work. Otherwise, it becomes another rock in my backpack that's already too heavy to, care, to carry. So it needs to be done, whether it's leveraging technology, current business processes, make it where it's part of my natural daily work to codify and share and connect with others what I know uh, because if we wait to the end of a person's uh, long career to capture their knowledge at that point, the organization is not going to get the maximum benefit from it. It needs to be captured and collected throughout the career. Yeah. And obviously, and probably because of your work in terms of an intelligence, one of the key things is how do you learn from it? You don't want every new assignment to be new. You want to right. be leveraging. And so you have a program in place to, to start you know, getting a sense of what people have learned through their careers. Yeah, that's right. Which is also, if you look at the connection to, you know, what Terry Cook talks about, a lot of work is actually done in projects and programs. So you can also say not only just individuals, but how, how do we learn from those programs as they're ending, what took place, and how do we get better, hopefully the next time. I um, wanted to maybe anticipate uh, interest in terms of, again, the young professionals uh, with a question around um, how do they learn? Do, do you see young professionals learning different and having different needs than, than professionals before when we started? Oh, definitely. Um, it's, and it's one of our events that we celebrate most at NASA is when we have our NASA first gradu graduation. Um, but we engage in what we call experiential learning with the NASA first, um, which takes some very interesting forms. So one of the things that, one of the attributes that um, leaders, whether it be projects or people or both, need to have at NASA is the ability to um, manage discomfort, to be in situations where what is happening is not comfortable to you and still be able to, you know, do what you need to do, stand up for what is right, um, et cetera. 
So one of the ways that we teach this, um, because you can, you know, give someone a lecture on right. how to deal with stress right. and et cetera, but one of the ways that we teach this at NASA is the daily dance party. So everyone, uh, a person in the class gets assigned to develop a playlist, and at noon, everyone in the class has to get up and dance in front of everyone else. And if any of you uh, are like any of us, I'm sure, the idea of getting up and dancing in front of your peers is terrifying to a lot of people. But what happens is you overcome that feeling of discomfort, you overcome that feeling of everybody's looking at me because of course no one is looking at you. They're all worried about how they look mm -hmm. dancing in front of all these other people. So really trying to find interesting and new and different ways to really address some of the challenges of developing into a leader in the agency through that experience, but in a fun, interactive, social kind of way. Yeah, no, that's a good, that sounds like that would be a great practice for the organization as a whole. I can see everyone at headquarters at well, noon. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I'm thinking, you know, we used yeah. to have cake. Right. But uh, now that we do these graduations virtually yeah. using our Do Adobe right. Connect technology, which is another way we're using virtual technologies, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that maybe what we have to do is have each NASA first class pick their song mm -hmm. and then have everyone who's participating virtually get up and dance with them That's right. during the ceremony. And it's healthy. And, well, it's, it's, healthy. Cool. and it's healthier, healthier yeah. than cake healthier and it's Healthier than free. cake, which is high caloric, <laughs> yeah. Very good. Uh, any th other thoughts in terms of you know, young professionals and learning, and what do you see across the, yeah. the federal you know, system? I think, I think Jerry's hit it on the head. It has to be experiential and interactive right. and engaging, and, and that's really what um, our younger generation is looking for, opportunity. The opportunity, um, and, and everyone, and I don't think it's generational, everybody wants to see the impact of their efforts. But I think sometimes as leaders and supervisors, we take that for granted. I mean, I know the impact right. of my effort, but maybe my GS5 or 7 doesn't get that opportunity, and they need that. So ways that we can engage them and um, give them the opportunity to um, show their leadership skills, back to what Terry was saying, and I think if we're looking at a project-based group, and we have, we're trying to do knowledge management, maybe we could do, there's a leader of the group, but he's got sort of a cohort where he's got a junior person that um, sort of tags team with them and give them that opportunity to lead and, and give them that on the job training. Yeah, the opportunities and the feedback it made me think. Absolutely. The beginning of uh, the career at NASA, uh, I was doing, did some assignment and I went to a senior leader and said, so how did it go? And he said, just, uh, just for future reference, if I don't say anything, it meant you did okay. <laughs> And if I said, and if I say anything, it's not a good thing. So I said, well, that's a, you know, so it's kind of a strange, strange environment, which, you know, fortunately yeah. is. I don't think that works so much now. anymore. Yeah. No, it doesn't. And it's really upside down. I mean, yeah. it's. Well, it, it used to be. Yeah. yeah. So but you're right. That's how that. it did used to be. Right. And fortunately, yeah. we live in better times yes. now. Yeah. And you so can't underestimate the value of on-the-job training and experiential learning. Yeah. And so the, the peer mentoring uh, you know, the Bureau for many, many years has had a probationary agent program where new agents, when they're onboarded, are giving, given a senior agent as a peer mentor who helps to teach them the, the ropes and the streets. It might, for my example, for example, coming into the Bureau as a stock and bond broker, being married up with someone who had years of street yeah. experience of going out and arresting bad guys and, and conducting investigations and going into places that you would normally try to avoid as the average citizen and giving you that confidence of how to enter those places, how to talk to the people, how to get people to cooperate, to find out. Um, so you need, that kind of, you need that kind of exposure. The flip side, of course, though, is these new employees coming on are bringing new skill sets that maybe aren't as prevalent in the current workforce. And so that mentoring relationship goes both ways in both teaching and imparting the culture and the way we do things to the new employee, but also for the new employees, we hired them for a reason. They're bringing talents to the table, giving them that opportunity to, to lead in new ways, to demonstrate their competence and grow in their experiences is really essential. Yeah. We uh, actually have a project going on here at NASA called Reverse Mentoring, and all the members of the Senior Management Council, uh, the most senior leaders in the agency, have agreed to engage in a reverse mentoring relationship where they reach out to a very junior employee 
um, someone who they would not normally run into in their daily, uh, daily work lives and ask that junior employee to mentor them on a topic of their choice. Many of them are choosing social media. So the idea that the, the um, new generation of people coming to the agency bring new thoughts and concepts that even, even the old dogs can learn new tricks, I think is kind of the idea there. But it also shows, I think, a commitment to this next generation that's coming into the workforce and a belief in them and their abilities. And I think that says a lot to that group of people. So if you are, being men if you are mentoring uh, the administrator, Charlie Bolden, or if you are mentoring um, you know, the Johnson Center director, Ellen Ochoa, um, and you're a GS7 engineer who's been at NASA for 18 months, this is a, a big experience for you. So it, it's, it's taking advantage of that idea that mentoring is a two-way relationship and actually flipping it over and doing that on purpose. And when you ask what are they bringing to the table, the, some of the things that we're seeing is an absolute passion and desire for mobility. They want to be able to do their job where they are, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Number two, they want to be able to connect with a greater social fabric within the organization. They are, they are not content to stay in just this cubicle and where their sphere of social influence is within the 20 feet around them. So they want to be able to connect with individuals on the other side of the world, if necessary, to get their job done. And they want to be able to have the tools and platforms and policies that allow them to collaborate in those ways, using those technologies and those processes. Yeah. The mobility. The connection mm -hmm. uh, and the ability the to leverage the social fabric right. of the organization to solve business problems. Yeah. It also serves, obviously, to to improve the culture of the organization. Hall, we, we talk a lot about obviously the development of the workforce and how to do that, but it's also about the development and the improvement of the organizations that we work with. And I think that, that example, the reverse mentoring, which I think is great. Um, you know, one of the ways to learn about something is if you're working with someone who, who, who's doing something that you don't know about. And so I've always said I need at least two young professionals just to figure out what's, what's going on in the world. The more diverse the crowd, yeah. the greater probability of achieving the right answer. And so diversity, connection, and collaboration will yield greater results. And so your policies, your processes, and your infrastructure, if it has a control-oriented or a control history has got to learn how to adapt and mold into that, still respecting both the culture and, and the processes, but allowing for them to thrive in that environment. One of the things I think maybe that assists us in this kind of leveraging, uh, you, you all have talked about leveraging resources from across agencies and working together, and obviously the fact that we're in a very resource-constrained environment. I mean, again, I remember at the beginning of my career, typically if you were working in an area, you held on to that work. You didn't want to get others involved because you wanted to own it. And now it's almost reversed. You're looking to seek partnerships mm -hmm. with other directorates, with other organizations, with other agencies. And we see that in different things. I know you've been heading up the, the federal knowledge management community, right. which has all the, the different agencies coming together and they share and they work. And a lot of the efforts, obviously HR, uh, you know, academy. And so, you know, the, the, the difficulties of the uh, of the budget crunch and things being tight positively force us to have to now work together. Yeah. And uh, do, you, do you see any... Yeah, necessity yeah. is the mother of invention, right. but poverty is the mother of collaboration. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, that's great. And uh, it is very, very yeah. true. And we, we've done in the federal government HR community over the last eight years or so have done a tremendous amount of um, consolidation and collaboration around our systems and our systems technologies. Um, but also uh, those agencies that are developing new tools, um, like NASA, are developing them in a vanilla kind of way so that they can be uh, exported to other federal government agencies and bolted onto those core systems that we have now. So I'm hopeful that more and more of that is going to be happening. And now that we're getting to the point where we can deliver more and more services, um, uh, you know, through iPads and Androids, et cetera, I think that we're going to make the user experience a lot more positive than it has been in the past, you know, with the multiple passwords and 
um, not being able to get to what you need to be able to get to. Right. Because I agree, um, the mobile workforce is absolutely critical. People need to be able to do their jobs from wherever they are. That's not the same as telework. Uh, telework is great. Telework was the first step, but the next step is you know, really enabling and equipping and training people to do their work from wherever they might be. Um, and I think that is an, uh, an expectation of the people who are now entering the workforce. And uh, hallelujah, the day has finally arrived for those of us who have been in the workforce for some mm. period of time. Mm. Yeah. No, you're all such great leaders. I wish I was 30 years younger <laughs> and I was starting my career. Um, which goes again, I mean, it was interesting because I think a couple of days ago, the CEO of Yahoo, yeah. Um, which was surprising that, that a company, I don't know, what, what do you think that was due to? I mean, well, basically there, indicating that you have to come into the office to work. Yeah. Here's, it, a, here's a social media firm. So it's, yeah, it's interesting because um, she also you know, has a small child. She set up daycare yeah. right in the office right next yeah. to her. So she's bringing home into work rather mm -hmm. than bringing work to her home. Um, and there is this concept. You find the same thing at Google. They really try to encourage presenteeism. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll change the oil on your car. You can get a haircut. They'll do your laundry. Um, so there's this idea that um, that uh, people are more innovative when they are physically co-located. I think what we're saying here on this panel is that you can be collaborative in a virtual environment, that the physical co-location is becoming less and less important as long as you can interact and connect in some way. And reality has to be with the work we do. It's right. with so many different partners and suppliers, and people are located all around the around the globe. In the workforce, change, this just today, the first half of the day when I was back at the office, I had at least three video teleconferences right from my desktop with, with a click away, access to colleague, brought up video chat. We're, we're chatting. I'm IMing at the same time with some others, and then walked into a physical meeting. So it's this blended approach to uh, these. Now, some of those that I had online virtual activity with, I've met in person. And so we've established mm -hmm. a level of rapport that then can bridge when we move into the virtual environment. There are others where I have only ever met virtually. And so you have this blended approach to your workforce and it allows us to connect geographically dispersed individuals to still get the mission done. But at the end of the day, for us, it's all about the results and the mission. And so what's our return on investment? These things are only enablers to get us to solve our original problem. Because whether we had all this stuff or not, we still have our mission. Right. And so if these things can help contribute to the mission, lower our cost, increase our productivity, make us more efficient or more compliant, then we pursue them. Right. Which makes it good, makes it easier, that original question of good practices. Mm -hmm. You want to encourage things that are important to the strategy right. of the organization and to the mission. And again, Going back to what Terry had been saying is it takes a triumvirate, it takes the business, it takes human resources, it takes the mission, you know, programs to be working, the leadership working together to make sure we know what the strategy is and the direction. Uh, so Being open-minded, things change, and so you have to right. be adaptive. Yeah. We, have, uh, we are accepting questions from Twitter and Facebook and, uh, and the Ustream uh, feed, and we have from Kevin uh, on Ustream for the, for the panel. What are the challenges and opportunities that you see with managing talent and competencies across the civil servant and contractor workforce? Uh, so what do you see as the challenges and opportunities with managing talent and competencies across the civil servant uh, and these including contractor workforce? So. Yeah, I, I think what he's getting there at there is the balance between federal government employees and contractors. Right. Um, and I think Catherine made a really good point, and that is that one of the th attributes that we know that makes the civil service workforce different than other workforces is longevity. Mm -hmm. That when we hire someone on board, the likelihood that they're going to stay for a good chunk, if not all of their career, is very high, even still. Um, although I, we, I do think we are seeing a little bit more movement. Uh, so that would tell you that a good strategy is for those capabilities and competencies that you know that you're going to need for the long haul of your mission, it makes sense to hire federal government employees into those positions and to um, base your knowledge management for those employees on those positions. For that work that you know has a shelf life and expiration date, then you're looking at um, hiring a contractor workforce to do that. But one of the things that's really critical is you're all working on the same mission. Mm -hmm. 
So you have to have a strategy that covers both, and you have to be willing to give access to your contractor workforce to the knowledge management opportunities in your agency. Um, you know, training, not so much. So a formal classroom training is actually prohibited. But um, they, making it um, resources available online that anyone can access, um, informal learning, informal uh, information exchange are all things where we can create a, a shared vision and a shared uh, workforce culture that takes both components of the workforce into account. I think in a lot of respects, if you look at Terry's framework on the project management side, I think oftentimes we consider our federal workforce to be sort of the business as usual. And we have a big project, and I think whether it's right or it's wrong, we assess the competencies of the federal employees, and we think that there's a lack of competencies on the project management mm -hmm. side. And we look outside mm -hmm. because we think the contractors have that project management mm -hmm. expertise. And so we want to bring them in for that project. And, you know, it happens, and I don't know if it's the best way to approach it, um, I think we do need to work on project management competencies within our federal workforce so that we can be well-rounded leaders and we can manage in a way that uh, maybe lessens the burden uh, or the necessity for contract workers. I couldn't agree with more with both of those statements. That, that is a right on point, both in balancing between what work is best done by your federal employee, and what work is best that is more transitory in nature done uh, by that, and increasing the competency of uh, project management. I just wanted to add one last wrinkle on it from a knowledge management perspective. We talked about harvesting the knowledge as a person is transitioning out of a job. The same thing is true there with these contractor workforce. They came in to address and solve a problem and they're working out. And then I would ask you how many of our contracts bake that in to the process that they Mm -hmm. Thou shalt leave behind a job book of how we got here. Because yeah. what ends up happening is something afterwards, then we have to go back and try to figure out how we got there. We end up having to hire someone new to come back in to help us figure that out. So I think, really, to become a learning organization, both inculcate that into your culture for your existing employees, as well as those that come in transitory to assist you with a special need or activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. It gets back to also how we think about the workforce, whether civil servant or contract, and do we set in the agreements so that we're looking for, for these lessons and, and for learning? And um, that way we maximize our taxpayer value. Yeah. We get into, to me, what's one of the most difficult things is measurement. And I was hearing what Terry said about the best organizations uh, are obsessed about measures, uh, which makes sense. I mean, how do you, how do you know uh, what is going well? So how do you go about, how do we go about measuring the value of talent development activities, whether it's technology or learning or recruitment or, or any of these activities, how do you, how, and how effectively do you think we do it uh, in government in terms of measures? We, in my office, we lean very heavily on the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey. Um, NASA was the best place to work in the federal government this year for the first time, and uh, we really rely on our employees to tell us whether they believe they work in an innovative working environment, whether they believe their skills are well used in the workplace, whether they believe their training needs are assessed. All of these questions are questions on the survey. And so we take those very, very seriously. We provide the survey results to each of the centers and to the subcomponents at the centers. So it goes down to um, fairly small organizational units so that the leaders of those organizations and the employees of those organizations can see how well they are doing from the employee's perspective. So we are very much dependent on um, the workforce telling us um, what it is that they believe is important to them. And then we can respond and give them what they need to continue to be successful. Right. So the employee feedback and the, yeah. the, the, uh, the federal uh, assessments in terms of how people feel about working in a place? Mm -hmm. Similarly, that, that happens at the FBI, where these employees, annual employee surveys are, are collected. We take that very seriously and have a high degree of participation from our employees. Then that feedback is aggregated up and is sent back down to those individual mission components and is tied to the performance and evaluation of those leaders. Okay. So you make that step of management and leadership, which would get at one of the issues that, again, we, we spoke to earlier in Terry's work, which is how do you make sure that the manager 
whether it's a project manager or a business manager, is giving people the ability to uh, innovate, mm -hmm. uh, to connect, and, uh, it, and is effective in the key, key role of management. If you measure properly and make it transparent, things will improve. The Innovation Index on the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey is the NASA uh, human capital metric for the agency as a whole and is also the key metric in my performance plan for the agency. So um, it's really important that everyone take the survey, fill it out, and give us their feedback because that is how we work, the information that we use to work to make the agency what it needs to be for people to be successful. And Catherine, I guess from OPM, how do you, you know, you're in, you're in different perspectives for the whole agency, but also you're probably looking at trying to encourage. So what, what are the measures you look for uh, when you say that, uh, that there are things that are good or, or, or maybe not? Well, so? if, you, if you look at the HR University example, which is a government-wide, um, we've, uh, we've got a population of over 16,000 users government-wide. And um, we, we've done some fun things on the front end. Um, the Chico Council voted unanimously as we were building out some of the additions in the second version, uh, the 2.0. Um, we opted to have star ratings. Mm -hmm. just like Amazon, right. um, because we wanted users to have that knowledge, just like in the marketplace. So if you took this course, whether it was free, it's still a time investment, mm -hmm. or whether it costs money, we want you to give your feedback and let others know whether it's valuable to you or not. Of course, in the back end, we collect a little bit more um, sophisticated data. Um, we do evaluation, I think, at, probably at about level two. Uh, when I was talking about the VA and their ROI project, they are looking at level four evaluations. They are doing some extensive follow-up with managers um, to measure uh, the improvement of skills on the job. Uh, and that is a big task, and not everybody can do that. Uh, it's, you know, it's a great way to measure if you have the resources, but not everybody will have the resources. So I think a common sense approach to getting feedback from the user is a very doable um, way to do it. And uh, if it's getting you the results you want, then you really can't argue with that. Well, and since every federal agency by law must participate in the survey, those are tools that are available to federal agencies mm -hmm. at no additional cost that are out there for them to use um, and really provide a great deal of insight. Mm -hmm. To the degree you can help your employees feel connected to the strategy and to the mission and that they have a voice in the process and the process change, they're going to participate. Yeah, a lot of the, again, themes coming, coming back of connection and having a voice and being heard in communications. Um, one of the things we started with, and Catherine, you started it with, you know, we need to know what the competencies are that we need and then where there are gaps. And so uh, if, if there's a young person who's thinking about getting into government uh, and they have time to kind of get the education development, what are some of the key competencies that we're looking for, that, that you see us hiring now and over the next uh, couple of decades? What, what kind of skills are we looking for? Certainly we are looking for STEM professionals across the federal government, um, acquisition professionals. Um, there's always a demand in the federal government for attorneys and economists. But pretty much the federal government employs people in nearly every discipline that's out there. Um, in terms of cross-disciplinary, I would have to say that um, writing and verbal communication skills uh, and project management skills, whether that's project with a big P or project with a small P, are very, very important and critical to success in a career in the federal government. It, in the federal government, if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. Right. Um, so people who are interested in public service careers um, should really focus in those particular areas in addition to maintaining or building their technical skills. A few years ago, the chief human capital officers came, uh, compiled a list of general competencies they called future focus competencies. And if you look at that list, it still holds valid today. And they were actually competencies that apply across disciplines. It's not just for the 201 HR series. It's really analytical thinking, again, the project management, communication skills, problem solving. Um, and those are available, you know, on HRU or just about anywhere you want to look at um, cross industry or cross um, cross discipline competencies. I think those are still very valid. You should tell them about HRU, how it's free for everyone. <laughs> have I not said that? Already? You have not said that yet. <laughs> it is free for everyone. 
So how do you find out about mm -hmm. HRU? It's hru.gov. It's very go. simple. Okay. Um, a lot of resources there for federal employees. Um, the training is accessible online. But even for the public, uh, if they want to talk about, look at competencies. Mm -hmm. as you're talking about mm -hmm. recruitment of right. external candidates into the federal government. There's a lot of general information that's free to anybody. Yeah, I was going to say a joke of how do you spell hru.gov. <laughs> <laughs> Same way you that's spell VW. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Similarly, I, we have individuals, everything from special agents, intelligence analysts, language uh, specialists, to those that repair and operate radios, build IT, manage projects. About 40% of our workforce fall into one single job series, and that's the 1811s, uh, which I am as a special agent. Uh, I can tell you, and we have core competencies for all of those different uh, job classes and series, but the kinds of skills that they mentioned are universal across all of those. I will tell you, you know, as a special agent, one of the critical skills we look for is their ability to interact with others, right, mm -hmm. and the ability to, to both uh, exude confidence and gather the confidence of others. Um, and, and, of course, absolutely integrity and, and adherence to the constitutional values that we hold true. But these, these same competencies, you know, when you look at someone and you think, wow, that's a really outstanding employee, they, you, you see these skills and competencies come up time and again, their ability to oral and written communication good problem solving and judgment. You just walk down those things, you're like, wow, they're hitting every one of those. Now they have developmental areas, and so I'm a big fan of individual development pro, uh, plans where em managers sit down with employees and say, what do you want to be? Where are those developmental areas that you're seeking? And then map out their work. They've still got to do the mission. But there are innovative ways to find within the mission space that this employee is working on to get them those development experiences so they can grow and become and round out those skills that they want. And we do that in our office, and, and it's great to see it when it happens uh, in places. And so even as in law, law enforcement, the social skills of working uh, is Absolutely, because it's about yes. how do we get you to play for Team America. Okay. Right. Absolutely. So we're down to probably a time for a final question. What I'd like to um, get a sense uh, from each of you, if you would, is um, on, on the positive side, I know this is going to be tough, but what one thing do you do or that you're part of that either most proud of or you feel is that, that this is something I want people to know about. Maybe the other side is what's your greatest concern uh, in terms of the work that you do or what, what's most difficult? You can go in any, any order. Well, I'll go first since I'm closest to you. <laughs> what am I most proud of? Uh, you know, we what, are good friends. There, yeah, we are. Okay. Uh, one of the things that, um, that I'm probably most proud of, the, the Knowledge Office team, we're a very small component within the Bureau. Uh, I, I like to say we're small, but we're small. So we really, our thing is to focus on those things that can have the most enterprise lift for the organization. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was begun a number of years ago was a Knowledge Awards and Recognition Program, where we canvassed the organization to identify those instances where individuals excelled in knowledge management, innovation, and information sharing, and then give them a microphone and voice to share that. And uh, that's really sharing those best practices and bringing to light the innovation and inspiration around the organization. One of the things that, that is a challenge or a concern for me that I think my colleagues here share, and we've, we've heard about it in our prior one, and that is how do we manage the changes that are coming to us, both in flat and falling budgets, uh, the exodus and turnover in workforce and the change that that introduces. Mm -hmm. And if there was ever a good time for knowledge management in the federal government, it's now. Of how can we save money, how can we breed efficiencies, and how can we ensure that good knowledge transfer happens both as we turn over positions, as employees exit, and as we onboard new talent. Very good. So the opportunities are also the, uh, or the challenges are also the opportunities. They are. Thank you, Gervis. I think... You know, my biggest uh, joy over the past three years has been working with the, the leadership on the Chief Human Capital Officers Council, led by uh, OPM Director John Barry, and with distinguished members like... Uh, and I didn't pay her fellow, to say that either. <laughs> <laughs> my Chico to the left from NASA. Uh, the director asked me to focus on collaboration three years ago when I joined, and collaboration has been the key to our success, whether you're talking about HR University, closing critical skill gaps, uh, performance management, uh, or any of the number of things that we've done uh, that positively have positively impacted the federal government, hiring veterans, disability hiring, diversity and inclusion. So the focus on collaboration has been um, one of the greatest things that I've been a part of. And the challenge is to keep that focus government-wide from my perspective because 
uh, with the increasing challenges across the federal government, um, Chico leaders are being pulled in so many different directions, trying to mind their workforce and trying to focus on the needs of their agency. And from my perspective, it, it's it's sort of a balancing um, tight walk rope, yeah. uh, tight rope walk, uh, to get them to focus on the bigger picture. And sometimes that that's um, sort of pulling resources where there are none. So that continues to be a challenge. Um, for me, I would have to say, um, my again, my biggest joy comes from the people who work with me on my team um, and their limitless creativity, their constant leaning forward and seizing of opportunities and their ability to create something out of nothing. So, you know, we'll say, okay, we can't, we can't bring everybody into town to have a conference of all the senior executives of the agency. What are we going to do? And they will go off and they will come back with a plan that is just blows your mind and is absolutely spectacular. And they'll do it at one-tenth the cost that bringing everybody into town would have cost the agency. So they're just limitlessly creative. And there's nothing better than working in an environment like that every day. My biggest concern is that how do we continue to inspire the next generation to public service um, in the current environment that we're working in? And we don't need to go into the details of that because we all know what that is. Um, but it, the, certainly NASA has a wonderful brand. And I think a lot of people don't even realize that NASA is federal government. But other federal government agencies don't enjoy, as the FBI has a fabulous brand, the CIA has a fabulous brand, there's lots of them out there, but other federal government agencies don't have that same luxury, and their missions are critically important to um, the United States, to our economic and national security, and how do we continue to inspire um, people to, to join the public service when there seems to be a dark cloud? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, uh, one of the things I'd say is uh, we're, we're out of time at this point. Uh, you're all inspirational leaders, and uh, I, I mean that. It would be uh, wonderful to work for any of you, particularly uh, starting uh, in a career. So I'm sure you have a lot of folks who are very fortunate. Uh, we, we've decided to focus on talent management and development because of the importance of it. Um, to me, I think I've learned a lot, so I'm hoping that, that you've learned a lot. I do want to thank our panel. Uh, Gervis uh, Grigg from the FBI, Catherine Medina from OPM, and Jerry Buckholz from NASA. Also want to thank our previous keynote who helped get us started with uh, always uh, brilliant research, uh, Terry Cook Davies, friend and colleague. And certainly want to thank NASA TV for always uh, putting on an exceptional event, making things very easy. Uh, and uh, my colleagues uh, from uh, the NASA Academy program project engineering leadership for helping to do all the work uh, to set this up. And I thank you for tuning in, and hopefully you'll join us uh, next time. So thank you.